Um, but uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me to give this presentation. Um, it was tremendous to get the framing that Martin gave the, uh, this morning, because like um, social cities of tomorrow, uh, what drives me um, is this opportunity that these new media technologies provide for us to really create a desirable future. And uh, the, I want to start off by, um, in, this, uh, uh, in this 20 minutes or so that I have, to sort of give you an introduction to the strategies that I've used to explore what it is that we can do. Uh, because like the organizers, I'm very interested in what I would call um, this crisis of agency, what to do, what to do in the face of collective climate crisis, um, environmental catastrophes of the scale we've never faced before. Um, you know, very um, paralyzing, typically, but um, this question of who can act, who has the right to act, uh, who is engaged, um, who has and who generates and therefore who interprets data, um, and then who can use it, that data to act, who can use that evidence to act, is a question that's long fascinated me. And uh, I'd like to show a few of the experiments I've done. So first of all, the uh, Environmental Health Clinic, which is something, uh, the framework in which I um, work in. I just need to play this little an animation a couple of times for you. So uh, I know this is very familiar to people who live in Amsterdam, but it's also my logo, right? <laughs> We share it, <laughs> and I'm happy to share. I couldn't think of a better city to share it with. So. Um, this, uh, in, in my case, I'm using it to redefine health, um, the traditional uh, ideas that um, health is medicalized and individualized and atomized and internal, genetically predisposed, pharmaceutical, versus health that is external, shared in the air quality in this room, in the food systems that we all suckle on and depend on, in the water we all share, in the environmental commons that we all share. And so I'm really, really trying to redefine environmental issues as health issues to create one of these uh, issues that, um, um, that sort of is this essential strategy of social cities of tomorrow. Redefining the environment as health and health as the environment, right? So twisting, if you will, the definition of health. Um, to create a clinic, um, which is much like a, a health clinic where people go because they have environmental health concerns instead of medical health concerns, and they walk out with prescriptions not for pharmaceuticals, but for things that they can do to actually improve environmental health. Um, and of course, I don't have to motivate that probably to this audience very much, but I like to because to ground it in, in our children, which is something we care about. Um, this is a, a study, um, and um, Philip Landrigan has done many like this, but he looked at how pediatricians um, who service our children, um, uh, what they do with their time, what are they actually addressing? And about 80 to 90% of their patient time is spent on five top things, One number one of which is uh, asthma, as you um, you can probably guess, um, and of course, uh, this is a the asthma epidemic is a recent one, um, produced in urban contexts where the rate of urban children with asthma is many times that of rural children. Um, the second most common thing they're addressing is developmental delays, ADHD, ADD, autism spectrum, all sorts of issues to do with this. Third is 400-fold uh, increases in rare childhood cancers. Four and five are diabetes which is di childhood diabetes and childhood uh, obesity, six months old. So there's an epidemic of six-month-old infants with obesity issues. Um, so all of these issues are not the, the sort of the germ theory of health that medicos are trained in, of course. They're all, what's common about them all, the environment is radically implicated. And it becomes, I think, a pressing issue when our children, if we think of them as our canaries, which is not something I would... <laughs> um, uh, but it, it does... I think emphasize the fact that we need to think about um, how we can reimagine our relationship to natural systems urgently, immediately, concretely, materially. Um, this is another really great way to motivate the issue that I'd like to talk about. Um, and my website for the clinic, the clinic records, is actually a social networking site. But um, you can, it's so social networking between humans and non-humans uh, because I think non-human organisms have a lot to teach us about how to um, share uh, um, resources 
and understand our natural systems. A recent stat a statistical analysis of over 20,000 animals that live, live with us in labs and in, um, uh, in our homes and feral animals to see if there was any evidence of the obesity epidemic there. And uh, of the 38 species that they looked at, every single species demonstrated this, right? Which suggests that the obesity epidemic, or to read from this, um, indicates that environmental fa factors beyond diet and exercise are at least partly to blame. So if we want to listen to uh, our animals, I suggest we take them quite seriously. Let me see if I can just quickly grab some audio. Um, this is uh, some communication technologies I developed for birds so that they could sort of catch up with our cell phone um, revolution. The perch is for urban birds so that when they land on it, it, it uh, triggers a sound, a sound file, that will say something like um, this. Here's what you need to do. Here's what you need to do. Go down there and buy some of those health food bars, the ones you call bird food, and bring it here and scatter it around. There's a good person. So in this case, we had um, many different, uh, it's been installed in a number of different places, but um, each with different arguments, each of the perches has a different argument to sort of see, uh, the birds can experiment on, on people, if you will, to see which argument best elicits elicits cooperative behavior. And um, in one of the cases, this was eight to one, the most popular argument. What birds decided was the best way to get humans to cooperate was this argument. Tick, tick, tick. That's the sound of genetic mutations, of the avian flu becoming a deadly human flu. Do you know what slows it down? Healthy subpopulations of birds, increasing biodiversity generally. It is in your interests that I am healthy, happy, well fed. Hence, you could share some of your nutritional resources instead of monopolizing them. That is, share your lunch. So biology 101 from the birds, our industrialized food systems have become sort of pathogenic cauldrons for producing an avian flu and swine flu, and, and we are culpable, and of course, uh, we can redesign them um, if we understand that. So um, just a quick word on the, um, the structure of participation that I use in the clinic because we have these field offices that are very useful for uh, meeting with people to change as an artist, designer, engineer, who it is I'm working for, with, in conspiracy, um, with a sort of the process of doing that. Um, so the field offices are very effective for meeting people and for really, um, you know, this floating field office on the East River is a great place to talk about water quality and what we can do about it. Um, uh, this was actually in Belgium. Um, it's a great place to talk about air quality. It really smells there. But it's also a really interesting place to draw on that very familiar um, working, um, almost banal icon of social organization, the roundabout, which unlike the traffic intersection where you delegate your responsibility for making a decision, even though it's your body and your car and your safety at stake, you don't or can't make the decision about whether it's safe to go. So some remote authority does that. And in the roundabout we have an example, a very familiar example where it depends on every single one of us making the right decision. And of course we get higher throughput and fewer accidents, even though it's a little bit more, it takes up a little bit more space, which is why they're not favored by traffic engineers. Um, it shows us that social, headless social movement works. It works well and uh, consistently. Um, so that's a good reason for talking about it. Here's the, one of the current field offices that I would invite you to come and have a meeting in. People who come to the uh, environmental health clinic are not called patients. They're actually called impatients because they're too impatient to wait for legislative change or other urban planning processes to actually address environmental health issues. And this is part of the Civic Action Exhibition in Long Island City, which is a chunk of New York City for which they asked me to develop an urban plan, um, in which um, I've used this office and a couple of others to, to organize who gets to input substantially 
uh, who gets to imagine and who gets to change what the urban infrastructure looks like. So I'll just give you a couple of uh, quick examples of of older projects and current projects. Uh, actually, I'll try and get through about 10 of them very quickly because I think the concreteness and the diversity of strategies is very important to cover. Um, uh, clean air, of course, is an a issue. Oh, I missed, I seem to have, um, okay. Um, that was to talk about the uh, air qu qualities of air exhibition, but it's, uh, uh, anyway, this is one of the prescriptions out of the environmental health clinic called the No Park, which is uh, takes a no pa a parking space, a emergency vehicle parking space, uh, and uh, prescribes the removal of the asphalt to create an engineered micro landscape. Uh, because this is actually one of the <laughs> the big issues that this is actually now a ma major pollutant in on sort of uh, estuary systems and bodies of water in urban contexts is the uh, massive network of roads and surfaces. That you know, we all use, not the big point sources, not the, the big polluters that have you know, been regulated at, at least somewhat successfully. Um, every one of us is implicated, right? No, the environmental strategies of suing the deep pockets no longer work in this kind of case. You know, sue me or you, you're not likely to get very much. Um, so, um, uh, so this is a strategy in the No Park where we remove the asphalt and create an opportunity for that that um, roadborne pollution to actually infiltrate um, into the massive subsoil res reservoir that we have. And in fact, if we did this on every um, every fire hydrant in Manhattan, these small actions that um, by themselves seem um, inconsequential. Uh, this is Mookie, one of the inpatients, who is actually sitting there selling, uh, explaining what the project is and selling what we call share prints, uh, which are limited edition prints that show um, what the no park will look like on one side and a, something like a share certificate on the other side. And she, she sold 200 of hers at $20 to her, to neighbors, to the block association, to friends, to um, her grandmother bought a lot. Um, so, um, uh, and then she had $4,000, which was the entire implementation cost for this no park, which changed not only who owned, who paid for the, um, the no park, but who owned it. Right, who felt uh, ownership, um, and um, there's a number of ways to do that. I just wanted to make the point that um, these uh, strategies, actually this was another way of enlisting people. Um, this is the, um, the um, climate clock no park, each of the clocks, each of the no parks are designed with the local community or the impatience and um, the shareholders to uh, to address different issues depending on their soil and their grade. And um, this one has blooming um, flowers that are planted in phenological order so that, uh, and th this comes additioned with a fingernail tattoo. So your fingernails grow at about a millimeter, um, two millimeters a month. So with that, you can see what's due to be blooming, right? So you can walk past and check on your, on your thumbnail, of course, to remind us that uh, viscerally we are part of the biological, urban, um, socio-ecological system ourselves, not somewhere out of it. Oh, this is what I was... So this um, brings me to this, this e example of the clear skies mask, which, of course, is the uh, named after the Bush administration had an initiative called the Clear Skies Initiative, that was um, effectively the dismantling of the, Cl the Clean Air Act. And for anyone you know, like me, telling the difference between the Clear Skies Initiative and the Clean Air Act, they, s they sound good, right? They both sound good. Who would have thought that Clear Skies would have meant 17-fold increases in mercury emissions from coal-fired power plants? Who would think that Clear Skies means more pollution? Orwell would call that doublespeak. Um, and I think it's a, you know, it frames the crisis of representation. Words are failing in our political systems to deal with these complex ecological issues. How do we even get a handle on something like uh, air quality? Um, so in this case, the clear skies mask, um, as you wear it around, the grime that accumulates on your pretty pink, um, on your on the mask that would otherwise be in your pretty pink lungs, circulating, um, compromising your cardiovascular health, um, causing asthma in uh, children. Um, you can actually read it off 
comparing it to the grayscale that we've screen printed on the standard OSHA approved N95 particulate matter mask. Um, so you get a very material measure of the air that you're exposed to. And this is some of the things we've built on. Actually, this is a recent project that's just um, been launched. We've got some new hardware in development that's, uh, that uses this point of view display, which is little LEDs on a wheel um, that when the bicycle is going at least five miles an hour, it will stabilize into an image. So we've been developing these occupies, if you will, um, that um, show us um, various geolocated real-time information. Um, the first one that we've launched with is, of course, on traffic fatalities. So as you ride through an intersection, it will show you the, it will display on your wheel, not only making you much more visible in that intersection, as a little bit of Times Square in your wheel, if you will, um, but also showing you what um, traffic fatalities have occurred um, over uh, aggregated over all time um, in that intersection as you go past. And that actually is actually then directed to um, uh, a website that, uh, of course, because it's highly local information, it then uh, directs you to various projects that uh, improve infrastructure for bicycles. There's a bicycle bridge that we've been building in Longland City, a bicycle Ferris wheel, you get 10 times the storage who wants to be here in this crazy city? You build parking lots for bicycles? I mean, it's great you have, you have that problem. But um, we can do better than parking lots. Um, so Ferris wheels for, for bicycles, storage is um, and another project we're doing a barn raising of uh, potentially later this year. So um, I wanted to show another bit of uh, evidence that is um, non-electronic, um, but is uh, this is from a project called One Trees, which is an older project in which I planted trees uh, all over the San Francisco Bay Area that are genetically identical. Um, uh, there were 6,000 genetically identical trees micropropagated from a single bunch of adventitious tissue called the paradox tree, and they were planted in pairs in different microclimates throughout the San Francisco Bay Area. And in this case, you can see the divergence. These two trees are planted you know, 15 feet from each other. What's that? Four meters, right? Um, so, um, and they have the same solar exposure. They have the same uh, soil conditions. They, uh, their divergence of their growth response has been extraordinary. Why? How do we explain that? And I've been, of course, puzzling on this with uh, many of the other trees, all of which have diverged enormously because, of course, this is a distributed biomonitoring instrument that all the trees are planted in public spaces for people to ask, why are the trees different? What, how, what's going on? Um, and in this case, the best explanation I've gotten, having talked to a lot of arborists and soil scientists and um, looked at the community structure of the soil microbial community and looked at all sorts of things, um, is from a construction worker who kept seeing me sitting across the road um, and he told me to look behind those trees, and I don't know if you can see, you can't really see, but I had never looked behind the trees. I'd looked at, you know, we'd all, um, and he pointed out that that was a sort of a low-rise 1950s structure behind it, and uh, the small one, and there's a, um, a Victorian, a grand Victorian, you know, uh, quintessentially San Francisco Victorian behind the large one. And he said, you know, you know, they're different, right? I said, yeah. Um, do you know what happened between those two? He said, the 1901 earthquake. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so he had to explain, he had to step me through this, um, that uh, that meant that foundation laws, or that building code had changed and foundations had changed. And so probably the massive difference between these two trees is that the foundation is different. So I learned that from someone you know, from on the street, a uh, construction worker who had expertise that I hadn't thought to go to. And it's that kind of lesson that I would argue the kind of diversity of human intelligence and experience that we need to make sense of these very irreducibly complex socio-ecological systems to answer why do these trees look different. So now I want to actually move on to some... Um, other projects, this is an interesting one that's based on um, a technological opportunity that's been delivered by the 
Federal Aviation Authority, who's created a new class of aircraft, of which the one I'm showing you, the Icon A5, is an example, a very sexy plane that um, um, some friends of mine are designing. And, and, uh, and that really kind of poses the question of what, what is, if we really look, what is the opportunity that this, this new class of, this new vehicle provides? Um, uh, in the FAA, in I know Australia, several European countries, because I know the best of these LSAs are coming, light sport aircrafts are coming out of, out of Europe. Um, it only takes 20 hours to get an airport, uh, a pilot's license now. So any of you in this room have a pilot license? Well, you could have by, what's today, Friday? You could have by probably, you know, next Wednesday if you want one. <laughs> so, um, so this is an interesting opportunity that radically changes the barrier to entry and, and makes us think, you know, does flight have to be the single most damaging thing that we do as individuals? Or could we more radically, could we go beyond the bike lane and think more radically about how our urban mo mobility might change, um, how we might exploit the opportunities? So, and I, I think it's interesting to kind of understand flight systems a little bit. Um, when you do a systems analysis of the sort of ecological footprint, the engineering effort that we put into the thrust systems and the fuel, um, in fact, the catering services on commercial airlines have a larger ecological footprint than the fuel. Um, and by far the biggest uh, impact we have is on our landing infrastructure, which we which almost invariably we build on what used to be called swamps or cheap flat land proximal to urban centres, but now we call them you know, wetlands, biodiversity hotspots, the most critical ecosystems for sequestering CO2 and for protecting the terrestrial east ecosystem, the loss of nutrients into the aquatic ecosystem it serves as a nursery for aquatic ecosystems and a wonderful machine. The only technology we have for breaking down many of the complex hydrocarbon derivatives and oily, horrible hydro, um, uh, industrial contaminants we have. Wetlands are the technology of the 21st century, let me tell you that. They're wet and slimy, but they're um, something to take note of. And so, um, in, in association with this new opportunity, with these new planes, I've been building wet landings, which are 500 foot um, small wet landings. You never have to level a wet landing. They cost about, you know, a hundredth of what it costs to, it's about $5,000 to do a constructed wetland versus a terrestrial wetland. Um, and of course, you then have to refurnish them, right, because wetlands, we have to retrieve them from the swamps of the cultural imagination. Um, so this is the heads down display, the heads way down display. With all the transformations in our laptops and cell phones, why don't we finish our, you know, papers and dissertations and theses, you know, in Starbucks and in coffee shops? We still sit in the same desks and chairs. Why not, um, you know, do it while you're watching the dragonflies and the, um, the tadpoles? So here's the heads down display. This is the heads-up display, very comfortable ways to integrate. Um, but then there's sort of this idea that flight could be a feasible form of, I mean, I know you're looking at me like I'm crazy, right? Um, but it's not me, it's the FAA that's decided general aviation has to be. Um, and I'm just interested in the ecological and social opportunity that really provides for us. And, and most of us really don't feel like we can have an opinion on what the future of flight would be. Um, so, which is why I addition these prosthetics for the imagination. These are strap-on flight simulators, if you will, that allow you to transform your car into a portable wind tunnel and explore, you know, with the, uh, you can see here, you can actually have different wing types. You can explore the different stability, the angle of attack and um, how that works. Um, here's a squadron training um, for this that, um, that really, uh, for those of us who've forgotten um, the wonder of flight uh, allows us to explore the possibilities. Um, and I think this material evidence, I would have to say that um, I make the claim, there's several ways I can do this, and I'd love to argue with anyone who'll take me on, that the, the, trans the skills, the pilot skills from this flight simulator are much more transferable than your traditional flight simulator on your computer or um, video. Um, uh, the visceral embodied and direct evidence of flight. Um, so if you then uh, earn your wings, you can then try this on um, a sort of at a larger scale and practice your wet landings. Um, here it is. I actually pulled up a little video so you can see what it's like to, uh, oops, 
to um, to actually um, do some wet landing so you can put these on. Um, so this was at the San Jose Biennial, flying over a wet landing and um, having some fun. There's many people. There's some people flapping. There's some people, actually. Anyway. Um, uh, this was what led to um, a wonderful collaboration with Usman Haq uh, in October last year called Flight Path Toronto, where, like New York City, actually, I was surprised to find that 60% of all the traffic fatalities in the area are not motorcyclists, not even cyclists, not the people who sit in the suicide seat of the, of the car, but pedestrians. So um, sort of the idea and the urgency to kind of more radically rethink our urban mobility um, becomes an opportunity for, um, in this case, creating a shared public spectacle. Um, this flight path actually involved building 15 towers, flight towers, and um, very fancy programmable um, laser lighting system that was responding to uh, the crowd. Um, you had to turn up there um, and get a little bit of flight training, go to flight school. You had an autopilot license, which you then, of course, signed yourself. Um, and then, of course, you could... Grandmothers particularly like this uh, thing. And then you could, um, you could fly. That's another little bit of training you get as you, in your graduation ceremony. Um, but let me... But um, then you can strap in and actually um, fly. Actually, what you were doing here... Um, with the lights is it responded to people's voices. So as you yelled, it actually it created these uh, ephemeral walls that people would uh, fly through. Um, and there were slower and faster rides. And, um, and what, what I think is important to point out here as a sort of spectacle is that um, through rain and sleet um, and uh, the hundreds of people who threw, flew through downtown Toronto um, the children weren't allowed to fly, but as some measure of that, um, uh, that kind of shared public memory that was created by this collective uh, spectacle, is that it changes what is possible, what is imaginable. And there's a whole heap of kids who've decided that um, ziplining to school, fast, cheap, very safe, safer than walking, right, and radically inexpensive is... Um, is the next thing, um, I'll have you know. Uh, so, so yeah. Um, I'm just going to finish off with a couple of uh, very... What, what this leads to, and I, this is sort of the, um, the work that I'm currently doing with um, sort of to think about how we can take these small actions into a larger urban scale and to finish off... Um, the, this is the elevator project which takes is in conspiracy with Otis, um, which takes the... Um, building code for Long Island City and, and um, requires that we upgrade the elevators. Upgrading them means that the elevators not only go to the Gen 2 elevator, which is 75% more efficient, um, but actually extends about 30% higher than the building. And if you don't know anything about Long Island City, it actually faces Manhattan, the sort of one of the most arguably charismatic skylines in the world that you can't actually see from anywhere. But by going up for the ride in the elevator, of course, it produces the view, realizes that asset, but also enables you to um, capture much more energy on the way down. So your, the energy balance becomes the the elevator starts to become actually a little micro power station. You can um, then also use the shaft with change in the fire code um, that uh, to pass because it's a greenhouse effect, right? A glass box on the top of the of the building. It actually heats up the thermal differential. It pulls air through, and that's why we've designed the 30% head is because that's about enough to replace an HVAC system in passively pulling through then using the, the very old um, architectural strategy of the shaft effect. And this, of course, gives you then access to the roof where you can then distribute um, goods and people and a staging place. Instead of, in the Long Island City, one of 25 commercial bakeries, Tomcat Bakery, delivers fresh artisanal bread all over New York City and 76 diesel trucks and biodiesel trucks every morning deliver plumes of fumes to Long Island City residents in 
Do we have to have food distribution systems that also compromise our health, or can we imagine something better? So I just want to go through a couple of uh, smaller um, things to finish with. The exercise program is personal training for individuals and in small groups where um, each person gets their own uh, personal training, you know, to improve your personal health, but also, you know, if you want to build up your deltoids or flatten that belly, that six-pack that we all like, um, uh, but also to improve environmental health. So one of your exercises on your bicycle route might be to stop and hula hoop. The hula hoop itself has um, uh, wildflower seeds in it. So as you're building up, it's a great core body conditioner, right? Good for the six-pack, but it also distributes um, uh, perennial seeds for the critical pollinators in an urban ecosystem. Um, there's many other examples like this. And I want to finish off with a couple of our non-human um, urban uh, cohabitants who uh, you know, are becoming ever more present. Uh, the phenomena of urban migration, which you may not have uh, heard of. When I went to school, it was and that meant the movement of rural people into the city, right, the poor rural. And now it actually means the movement of animals formerly known as wild into urban centres. It's an international phenomenon, particularly in the developed world, for loss of habitat. But also because we're making our, our every green space is an invitation for non-humans to cohabit with us. And yet we don't actually do this very well. This is another one of the sports I'll just... Um, uh, you know, uh, we skip through very briefly. Um, the strongest animal in the world is the rhinoceros beetle, I'll have you know, an undersung hero of the underworld who churns um, the rhizomic sphere and creates, oxygenates this to really create tremendous um, soil biodiversity. And most of us haven't had any intimate association or particularly care about this magnificent creature, but now you can actually um, wrestle a rhinoceros beetle um, and it, this machine actually scales down human forces to rhinoceros beetle scale and scales up uh, rhinoceros beetle forces to human scale. So there's a level, level playing field in much the same way that the, the optical zooming is done a particular way. There's a point scoring system and I offer a varsity scholarship for any students who are champion rhinoceros beetle um, wrestlers um, and who'd like to come to study with me. This is, this is how you do it, as you um, learn to appreciate sort of the intimate relationship with these, um, these fascinating organisms on which we critically depend, right? We all depend critically on these creatures and, and we've excluded them. So I'm going to finish off finally with um, an uh, urban agriculture initiative called Pharmacy, the charge of which is not just... Uh, as you know, the, I think the uh, imperative to act um, and the charge of this is not just to do urban agriculture, um, not just to exploit the, not just to produce edibles, but to pr produce edibles that actually improve environmental health, that increase air quality um, and augment biodiversity. So pharmacy, the first step of which is based on the ag bag, which is this very simple Tyvek-based system. Tyvek, you know from your FedEx envelopes, is incredibly strong, uh, but it also breathes, it has mi micropores, so this is oxygenated. Um, and uh, lightweight and radically inexpensive and can just flop over any, uh, any railing, window, uh, parapet to create arable territory out of thin air. Um, it works as closed system agriculture instead of draining the, the water out. I use a polymer like the ones that you have in your diapers, or not your diapers, but your children's diapers, uh, nappies. Um, so it pulls the moisture out of the soil uh, and then releases it back to the soil when it's needed. So you, it's very um, conservative. But it exploits the, what we have, the asset that we have in urban ecosystems, which is a great deal of verticality. We don't have access to the um, subsoil. So um, this allows us to very inexpensively coordinate um, a... Um, I don't know if you've... Those of you who've explored urban agriculture, it's characterized by being extremely expensive and unwieldy, and in this way, uh, with this very simple, inexpensive device, we can coordinate with many people. So your neighbours can actually do it as well. And you can put a, a snail superhighway between these two. If you glue, super glue on an RFID tag, you can actually um, snails go at just the right the right speed for RFID um, readers. So you can send snail mail 
up to your, um, your neighbours. You can also write on these. We've got a calendar system for uh, collecting data in a very uh, interesting and important way for understanding the phenological changes. Um, uh, snail racing is uh, another very lucrative business to get into. Snail milk, milking snails. Uh, intense, uh, I'll, I'll tell you about it later. Um, <laughs> but um, I just want to finish off with this one fish interface because I think this is um, another example of how we can locate uh, information in places where people can act on it, can interpret it, can own it, can use it. Um, this is a, an array of buoys that, um, as the animation showed, as a fish swims under, it lights up. Um, this is the version of it in the East River. It was also in the Bronx River. It has one layer of lights that are always on for showing you water quality, and the bottom layer of lights that, that turn on as the fish swim under, as I, uh, as I mentioned. Um, um, and most people, the first question they ask is, is there any fish in the East River? Yes, you can see there's a, where is it? There's a fish going across the front row right there. And down there, yes, there are fish in the East River. Um, and not only can you see that they're there, you can then text them. And the fish text you back. Um, uh, this is, begins an interesting conversation. And then you can also feed them. So the fish... Um, actually, you can see here, these are fishing lures, which are, um, we give out. These are uh, food that's um, nutritionally appropriate for fish, rather than Doritos or cigarette butts or, or popcorn or chewing gum, the sorts of things that zoos and parks always say, you know, do not feed the animals, right? Why not feed the animals? In this case, we're making nutritionally appropriate fishing lures. The hook is, there is no hook. Um, and actually, we augment them that uh, with a chelating agent called, uh, oh, it's a chitin derivative. And when fish ingest it, and when you ingest it too, it um, binds to the bioaccumulated heavy metals, passes out as a complex form where it's less reactive and settles into the silt where it's effectively removed from bioavailability. And the aggregate effect of that is that um, many small actions can add up to significant environmental effect. And that's where I'd like to finish because this idea of, you know, particularly environmental issues of, you know, turn off the lights, which are, you know, use less paper, eat less food, less meat, use less pesticides, it's all about what we can do less of instead of what we can do and making it good. Thank you.